I like to listen to podcasts, and I've been listening to more than one podcast about the TV show The Office. I know, I'm a fan. There's one by Brian Baumgartner, who played the character Kevin on the show, and it's called An Oral History of The Office, and he's trying to figure out why is this show so popular? I mean, it was on TV from 2005 to 2013. Yet today, it's the most streamed show online. In fact, NBC just like built a whole streaming service around it. But they looked when it was on Netflix, and last year, in 2020, more than 57 billion minutes of The Office were streamed by people. Just last year alone. The most popular one. That's wild. So on Brian's podcast, he interviews creators and cast and crew, and he's trying to figure out Why does this show mean so much to so many people, even young generations? And he realizes that the characters are relatable, even when they make them cringe. And the people on the show just loved being there. And he said, I think that makes a difference. In fact, the podcast that moved me so much was when all the characters talked about having to say goodbye. Goodbye to Steve Carell. He was the star of the show. And after seven seasons, it went on to nine. He left. And so it wasn't just a change in the cast of characters. He was a leader on the screen. His character, Michael Scott, led the office. But he was a leader in real life. Rain Wilson, who played Dwight, says, I had great reservations about the show existing without Steve. Creed Bratton, who played Creed, said, I told a few people I thought it might be time to stop. How can it go on? Kate Flannery, who played Meredith, said, He was the leader for so long. He kept our egos in check. He made sure that the show was the star, even though clearly he was the star. Jenna Fisher, who played Pam, said, People talked about, What stories are we going to tell? Who are we without this leader? And John Krasinski, who played Jim, said, It felt like the end of an era. It felt like the end of our show in a way, or that evolution of our show. It's like when you graduate college. Your life isn't over, but that version of your life will never come back. And it's true, when Michael left, they did lose millions of viewers. And so the cast and the crew all wondered, what's next? We've likely asked that question ourselves. If a leader has left our lives, a mentor has moved on, an organization has shifted, and then we wonder, how's that going to affect my future? The disciples, Jesus' disciples, they asked that same question. We're in our series called Good Grief. And grief moves in unexpectedly on our lives, you know? It takes up residence without permission, and we have to deal with the consequences. And we've talked about the ways that grief comes out in confusion, doubt, not having any hope in life, you know? And so now we're going to look at anxiety that happens. And that's part of grief. When we have anxiety over change, it's grief because change means things are going to end. You know, just like the office crew members and cast members said, like, they were grieving. And it was like the end of their education and something new happens after you graduate from college. The disciples, they'd spent all this time with Jesus and their training has ended now. Something new is about to happen. In our scripture, here's where we are in our timeline in John chapter 21 today. It's been over a week since Jesus went to the cross, died. And then it's been a week since the disciples saw him alive again. But he's doing some things. He's not hanging around with them. And he kind of gave them this indication that he was not sticking around. So that's going to cause them some anxiety, you can imagine. So they're going to ask, how do we minister to people from now on? Who are we supposed to reach? What kind of leader are we going to be? Basically, they're asking, what's next? So let's dig into John chapter 21 and see the special encounter Jesus had with his friends. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to the disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, two other disciples, they were all together. I'm going to go out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. It sounded like a simple conversation, right? I'm going to go fish. Okay, we'll come. But I kept trying to think of like, what was their motivation to go out in that boat? And I thought of three possible options. Option one was maybe they needed some finances. I mean, they had been out wandering with this rabbi for three years in ministry. 
And maybe they just needed to go fish because that was a way to sell the fish and get some quick cash. Peter, it says he has a mother-in-law, so imagine he's got a family. Even just providing financially for ourselves is a big thing, right? They needed money. Number two, option number two, maybe they went back to doing what they knew how to do because this new thing, ministry, just maybe seemed too intimidating. I mean, Jesus was alive again, but if he wasn't staying with them, should, should they keep going? Were they ready? Is this a thing they were going to just change their lives for? So maybe it just felt easier to fish because like that's something they knew how to do. Now, both of these options, if, if their motivation was either one of these, that's a reaction to anxiety, like trying to provide for yourself financially that causes us anxiety. Not knowing if your dream can happen, that can cause anxiety. But then the third option, I feel like, I feel like maybe it was a relief from anxiety. Maybe, maybe the disciples went back to fish because it was just like, relaxing like a way to process like something they knew how to do it was second nature so consider all those emotions right they're grieving jesus's death they're fearing being arrested by the authorities themselves they're overjoyed by jesus being back and then he's not hanging around and now they're like oh filled with this tension so maybe going to fish was just like decompressing for them deal with their anxiety okay so Verse 4, let's see how Jesus shows up. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat. You'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Jesus is looking really different after his resurrection, or maybe he's like doing the disguise thing again that we talked about a couple weeks ago. I just imagine he has a little bit of a twinkle in his eye as he's saying this. Like, okay, on the finale of The Office, I'm not giving anything away, but Jim spent his entire career pranking his coworker Dwight. But he decides to do something nice for him here at the end, and he calls it a guten prank. He was trying to use a language that sounded like Dwight. He called it a good prank. Guten prank. So I feel like Jesus is doing a guten prank on his disciples here. Like, Like maybe he's just, maybe he's laughing because he's like, they don't know it's me yet. Just wait till they throw the net over. I mean, it might have just made him giggle a little. And I'm sure maybe we don't always think about Jesus giggling or laughing, but you know, he was human and humans are pretty silly and goofy at times and we got to get our humor from somewhere. It's probably God. Well, now I can just see Jesus watching all this happen, waiting for it to click in their minds and then it does. Verse 7, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it, he wrapped his outer garment around him and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore. They suddenly realized, I know this miracle, this net full of fish. You know what? Because it's not the first time Jesus did it. Luke 5 tells us the very first time that Jesus ever met Peter, James, and John. And they were out fishing. And so right before he called them into ministry, he watched them struggle to catch fish. And he told them to go out into deep waters again. And they're probably like, what the heck does this guy know about fishing? He's like a teacher or something. But they did it again. And and this is what happened. They caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Jesus' first guten prank on these guys. (laughs) But it was also a metaphor. Jesus told them in verse 10 of Luke 5. He said, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to fish for people. That net that was breaking (laughs) full of fish, he was trying to show them that this was the abundance of people whose lives they were going to make a difference in. People who they would share Jesus' love. They would bring more people into a loving, caring relationship with God That's what he had been training them to do for three years. He called them through fish. And now here, it's a week after his resurrection, and they don't know yet what they're about to become. But we know. We already know the leaders they're going to be. And in fact, because they kept doing this ministry, that's how we know about Jesus today. But they didn't know it yet. 
They were in that turning point, that moment. But you know what? I just love this. To know that that's the first interaction Jesus had with these guys. So here he does it again, this fish miracle net thing. I think Jesus was trying to get them to recall their first moments together. Like a little time to reminisce, to do the thing that brought them together at the first. Kind of like, hey, remember when we did that? I just think it's so sweet. Um, You know, Steve Carell on The Office, he got to actually help write the ending for his character. And rather than have a big party scene, he wanted to do one-on-one scenes with every character throughout the episode. But then it hit him. Steve said, it was almost more than I bargained for because that's what happened. I had scenes with everyone in the cast and it was, it was emotional torture because imagine saying goodbye for a week. It was just fraught with emotion and joy and sadness and nostalgia, but it was also really beautiful. This time Jesus had with his guys, it's probably pretty beautiful. I also think he was doing this miracle as a reminder. Because as they reached their arms and they pulled in the weight of that net, there was a muscle memory there. And with the physical, it probably triggered in their minds this reminder that Jesus said, you've got this. Like he told them they would fish for people. He knew they could do it. He believed in them. Through this physical act, I think he was trying to remind them, remember what I promised you. You've got this. It was a simple fishing trip, but now it's like, nope, not crying, that's ocean air. Let's see the conclusion of this time together. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat, dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? I guess they were still confused. They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. And he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. That's all we hear about their group conversation. We're going to hear about a one-on-one conversation next week that happens after the meal. But we don't really know what else went on during the meal. Did they laugh? Did they tell old stories? Did they burp? Maybe words were not all that necessary because the guys just wanted to hang out. And that's what mattered. You can see the love of Jesus and his encouragement in his actions. Just to spend, spend another morning on the shore with his guys. One last time. If you're a Hamilton fan, you know that reference. But it was their last time. Just hang out and be with each other. Just like old times. Receive from him some encouragement before things changed. There's a lot of reassurance in just that routine and a meal together before things change. Change is always part of a life, but it's usually never easy. It's usually filled with anxiety, even when we're the ones that want to make the change. Because, you know, it's tricky to say goodbye to things. Even tricky to start something new. But watching the way Jesus and his disciples navigated this change, we can learn some things. So here's what I want to say to you. If you are leaving something, maybe you're leaving a job to go to another. Maybe you're leaving one neighborhood to move to another. Maybe you're leaving a volunteer position, an organization, a community group. If there's a space you normally go to and you show up in, but you're not going to anymore, this is for you. Number one, I want you to end well. Treasure time with people before you go to something else. It may feel so much more comfortable to you to just ghost, like no fuss. But just know that it's going to mean a lot to people if you would end well and talk to them. If you would spend a little time, be a little patient before you run out that door. Maybe it's just one-on-one, just like Steve Carell did. But, you know, just spend that time. It means a lot more than you might realize. And part of ending well is once you go, check back in sometimes. Don't just leave and leave, because that can hurt too. You developed real relationships, so check back in on those, okay? Number two, recognize grief, your grief. You might be so excited to go ready and jump into something new, but you're leaving something. 
And it's okay to feel slightly sad, maybe a lot sad, even though you know the next thing is good. It's okay to say, this is grief. Feel it, live it, sit in it for a little bit, okay? Honor it. Honor the person you became in the current situation before you move on, okay? If you're the person staying, if you are part of that organization and someone else is leaving, someone's moving out of your neighborhood, Someone's headed out and there's going to be a void there and you're sticking around. Here's your challenge. Number one, give grace. As much anxiety as you feel in this change, being the one left behind, the person leaving, it hurts them too. More than maybe they let on. They might put on a good face, but they're feeling it, okay? Just give them a little grace. You can give yourself grace too because you're going to feel frustrated. You might just be mad at them for leaving, and that's human. It's okay to feel. So give everybody grace in this situation and just try to treasure, right? Okay. Number two, be brave. There's going to be a void, right? And you might be called to step into the void. Maybe you imagined being assistant to the regional manager your whole career. Maybe now you need to become the manager. Might be scary, but maybe God's ready, developed you for this moment. Or even if you're not the one stepping up, God is calling you to go support and encourage the person who does. They're going to be different than the former leader, but they're going to need encouragement and support and to know someone's by their side. Go be that person. Okay, for the office, the show, as I said, it went on two more seasons without their original leader. It wasn't easy for Steve to leave, as he said, but the people understood. Showrunner Greg Daniels, The original showrunner said this, you couldn't be mad. He was so graceful and full of integrity. Brian Bumgarner, who played Kevin, concluded this. He said, Steve's departure threw our show into a tailspin, transformed our storyline, but ultimately it reinforced our bonds as characters, as teammates, and as friends. Isn't that what happened to the disciples? Their leader was leaving but it brought them together. It threw them into a tailspin, but it changed their storyline. They became the leaders Jesus believed they could be. You know what? Our church has gone through some changes over 15 plus years. We've changed buildings. We've changed the times that we meet on Sundays. We have changed staff members and elders, leaders. People have come and gone. This last year, 2020, whew, there was some change we had to adapt to. Everybody did. And it brings anxiety. But we have stuck together through all of those changes. I thank you for sticking with us. If you're joining us for the first time, I want you to know that this is a community that sticks together. And we'll still need to continue. The world is still changing. There's going to be a void here and there that opens up. And we got to figure out how to step in. As Echo Church together, how are we going to fill the void with Jesus' love for all people, demonstrate for our city, for our world, who God is, what he's called us to be? We're going to figure it out. What's next? Let's figure it out together. Walk with one another. Strengthen one another. Let's figure it out together. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for being with us through all the changes that come our way. Thank you for ending well, for leading your disciples. Thank you that they stepped up. Help us do the same, whether we're leading and leaving, staying, stepping up. Help us to look like you as we live this life together. Amen. Have a great week. 